What's up everyone, Acid Glow here. I'm back with another Doom Eternal lore video. Over the past few years, I've covered a bunch of topics in Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. This video will be one hour long, but cover an enormous amount of topics. It's meant for those people who want to watch longer videos while discussing many ideas. This will include videos that I have uploaded in the past, so keep that in mind when I bring up any theories or try connecting the storyline together. With the first DLC being released, which is The Ancient Gods Part 1, we can now go back and look at other things that can still be shrouded in mystery. Because the video is one hour long, I'm going to provide timestamps before we start. This way, you can skip to a topic you may have missed in the past. The topics will include a few videos around the Demonic Crucible, which is my favorite part of the entire lore, along with the prophecy behind it, a look back into Argent Energy in Doom 2016, and some other topics around the Korax Tablets, Samuel Hayden, the Seraphim, the Angels of Erdak, Elemental Wraiths, and a lot more stuff. There are too many things to list for this short description, because when I make videos around the lore in Doom Eternal, I tend to bring up other topics on the side. So while the title might be the main focus of the video, you will find other things we can discuss. But if you enjoy videos around the lore in Doom Eternal, mixed with theories and discussions, I'm hoping you will enjoy this compilation. So with that being said, please leave a like on the video and let's get started. What is the Crucible in the Doom game from 2016? Is it a weapon or an artifact? What purpose does it serve? It was first seen at the beginning of the game. When the Doom Slayer is awakened, he emerges from his tomb and quickly searches for a weapon. When the Doom Slayer retrieves his Praetor suit, a hallucination quickly occurs and images of the Crucible can be seen. When he reaches the Lazarus Labs, he comes across the Helix Stone. Upon touching it, more images of the Crucible show up, but this time, an altar and a strange source of energy connecting to the Crucible are shown. The Helix Stone was taken from Hell during the early stages of their excavation. The inscriptions on it give them information on how to manipulate the energy from Hell and use it for their own benefit. The mark on the Helix Stone is also seen when the Doom Slayer awakens. It's also visible on his helmet. Although it seems, the Doom Slayer tries to brush it off when he sees it. This might indicate that this symbol was placed after he was buried, which could explain why he was intrigued when he saw it. This is the mark of the Doom Slayer, which was burned upon his crypt. It was a warning to all the creatures of Hell that what lied within the sarcophagus must never be freed. Now the same symbol can be seen on the Night Sentinels who fought against the demons of Hell a long time ago. They were betrayed by one of their members who struck a deal with a Hell Priest named Daeg Grav. He ended up cursing their source of power while they rested. The Night Sentinels were defeated and their souls were trapped. As for the member who betrayed the Knights, he wished for his dead son to be returned, but he was deceived by the priest and his son was brought back but turned into the Icon of Sin that assured their victory in the war. But now, the Icon of Sin lays dormant. According to ancient tales, after the Doom Slayer was granted powers by the Seraphim, his speed and might were increased, and with his armor being made from the forges of Hell, he was unstoppable. He was even able to defeat the Titan, the most powerful demon from Hell. The Doom Slayer was buried by the priests, and his armor was removed. It was the only way they could stop him. And there he laid, to rest in silent suffering. Now the demons were entering our world through a portal, and it must be closed from both sides. The portal from Hell is powered by an unlimited source of energy, and they called it the Well. But after the Doom Slayer destroys the hinges on the filter that creates Argent energy from the Well, the portal closes on our side but it remains open in hell, and that is where it must be closed to stop the demons from coming through. The Doom Slayer is then sent in to find something called the Crucible, an item that Olivia was looking for, 
The crucible is in track down to the necropolis, but it is protected by the hell guards. After they are killed, an altar rises and the crucible is acquired. Upon closer inspection, it seems to be made of bone with glowing crystals at the top and bottom area. The lower part is seen to have a skull with some spikes on the head area. It is used later on near the end of the Argent Denur level. The player would have to close three sources of energy that power a portal between Hell and the UAC base on Mars. The bottom part of the crucible will extend the spikes and this punctures the energy spheres which cause them to explode. When all three spheres are destroyed, the portal from Hell is closed. The crucible is seen again during the ending of the game. You are transported back to Mars via the tether system in your suit. You are greeted by Samuel Hayden, who has been assisting you throughout your mission. But as he stuns the Doomslayer, he takes the crucible from him and reveals that he knew a lot more than he led us to believe. He activates the crucible to reveal a giant energy blade with visible runes. Samuel then transports the Doomslayer to an unknown location as he walks away with the crucible. Even though the portal was closed and Argent Energy was no longer attainable, Samuel acquired an item from Hell that will allow him to further his research. Now there's some information coming from the Doomslayer Testaments that indicate this crucible might have been used by the Doomslayer before in the past. He was listed as being able to travel through worlds and time. Then during the eons of battle against the demons of hell, he was said to use a sword and shield with adamantine strength. Now it's possible this could be the sword he used during that battle, or perhaps he was familiar with the sword because his helmet is able to translate languages and operate any weapon. So that covers the Crucible in the Doom game from 2016. I've seen other games that have a similar weapon, only the handle is shown, then the energy blade forms upon activation. Now the last two things I want to point out was in Doom 3, there's a tablet that shows a picture of a demon that looks very similar to the Titan creature that was defeated by the Doom Slayer a long time ago. There's also another tablet that shows what looks like the Doom Slayer using the Soul Cube. Even though the Doom 3 story had mentioned the ancient Martians were using the Soul Cube during their war against the demons, it seems as if perhaps the tales about the Doom Slayer being a time traveler could be true. Now the last thing I want to bring up are the Praelian Thors that were mentioned in the story of Doom 3. Were they related to the Seraphim who gave power to the Doom Slayer, or the Wraiths who gave power to the Night Sentinels, or the Night Sentinels themselves? There are still a few questions remaining and I'm hoping the rest gets revealed in another game. What is Argent Energy in Doom from 2016? The story of this energy source stems back to when the forces of Argent Denur were battling against the demons of Hell. The well was a source of unlimited energy that originated from Hell and was used by the demons. When the Night Sentinels were betrayed by one of their own, a dark priest from Hell named De Grav would trap their souls within, along with the power of the elemental wraiths. The world of Argent Denur would then be absorbed into Hell. The UAC would locate some of this energy source on Mars in 2095. It was first known as the Argent Fracture. Their plan was to harness this energy, but before they could do that, they had to complete their terraforming mission on Mars, which only took one year. A structure called the Argent Energy Tower, or the Argent Inductor, would charge this unrefined energy with radioactive isotopes to very high temperatures. When it reached a certain point, it was contained within a sphere. When the surface tension of the plasma sphere is broken, the contents within will discharge and will energize anything it touches. This energy source was used to power Vega, the artificial intelligence that was used during all operations on Mars. The central processing temperatures of Vega's core was hotter than the surface of the Sun. So a supercooling structure was made alongside its miles of circuitry and millions of processing stations. The Advanced Research Complex, also known as the ARC, was responsible for several breakthrough studies like BFG development, teleportation research, and cybernetic augmentation. The Lazarus labs were more focused on cross-dimensional anomalies, entities, and artifacts. These items were sent to the Lazarus labs and never seen again. Their research was kept as a secret amongst everyone else on the base, but the helix stone was found within Olivia Pierce's office, and upon touching it, the stone would reveal the location of the crucible weapon.
Argent energy was also used to create temporary interdimensional rifts to Hell. The UAC would use these rifts to transport artifacts from Hell back to Mars. During some testing, Olivia Pierce discovered that Argent energy would also create biowaves. These waves would result in the creation of the Revenant creature. The Lazarus Project wanted to make human operatives into demonic soldiers. The constant biowaves from Argent energy would melt away their flesh and rot any organs. The creature known as the Summoner would use similar biowaves to turn humans into possessed soldiers. Further studies have shown the waves have some type of genetic coding embedded into the particles. This could explain why a subject would transform when exposed to these biowaves. These biowaves could also subdue creatures that use similar powers like the Summoner. Further studies have shown the Summoner was a highly evolved subgenus of the imp form. The Lazarus project would also include creating the Cyber Mancubus. They wanted to make the Mancubus focus on long-range combat, so they grafted rifling barrels onto their arms. This allowed them to shoot their toxic bile much further, but this also meant it would no longer ignite where it landed. During an experiment to genetically modify a pinky demon, one subject resulted in having limited psionic abilities that made it invisible. They also tried to increase its ocular capacity, but it later escaped when it was released by accident. It was found several months later along with a second specimen. The offspring also carried the same psionic abilities, but they were unsure how the original specter had breeded. Argent energy was also used to power their technology, weapons, and could even be used by the Doomslayer's armor. But the Lazarus Project would also discover that in small doses, Argent Energy could reanimate dead flesh. During an expedition, they located the remains of a Shadow Lord that they thought was a Balgar demon. The thought of having an ultimate battle demon under their control was a chance they would not give up. They attached high-tech weapons to its body and reanimated its cells. A single Argent Accumulator was placed in its chest to power its body. The Cyber Demon was placed in a brain-dead state during this procedure, but when a link between its brain and Argent Accumulator was made, it immediately sent an energy surge to the Medulla Oblongata. This allowed it to regain motor functions of its body. The Cyber Demon was able to withstand a lot of punishment, and with the use of Argent Energy, it could rebuild any dead tissue and continue fighting on. It was only contained when a member named Jacobson would sacrifice himself as bait. He lured the Cyber Demon into holding Pen 6, and there it remained, until the Doomslayer would find it. Because Argent Energy was known to be more stable at higher temperatures compared to normal plasma energy, and combined with its unlimited amount, it became the main energy source for humanity, and all other forms like nuclear, oil, and solar would become obsolete. Argent energy could also be channeled through such practices such as human sacrifices. Olivia Pierce's group would later band together and form the occult. They became obsessed with a secret knowledge from Hell. The name Argent is derived from the Latin word Argentum, which means silver. What happened to the Crucible after Doom 2016? What is the secret prophecy about the Crucible? And how is the Seraphim linked to Samuel Hayden? That's what I want to cover in this video. So this video is very long because I don't want to skip over important events of the past. There's also a bunch of smaller topics I want to bring up that we can discuss. Now one of the most important pieces of lore and mystery of the Doom universe is something we collected back in Doom 2016. Something so dark, evil, and with a hidden past that could be linked to something worse than the Makers or the Icon of Sin. The Crucible appeared to us in the beginning of Doom 2016. As you reach out for your armor, a flashback occurs. Within the blurry and flashing images, we can see a couple of things. A spire with Argent energy, a possible temple, the elemental wraiths, the well, and the Crucible. You are later introduced to Samuel Hayden, the head of the facility. His team was using Hell's resources as an unlimited power source. A hellwave was activated from the Lazarus facility, which transformed 64% of the personnel there. And one of his employees had turned against him. You would learn about what's been happening on the facility regarding Argent Energy. When things got out of control, he released the Doomslayer from his prison. It's like Samuel already knew what the Doomslayer could do if he was set free. 
Olivia Pierce worked in the advanced research complex. She became obsessed with the Helix Stone during her research, an artifact that was pulled from hell in the early days of the program. She kept it in the Lazarus labs and would barely report back to Samuel. From it, they learned how to manipulate hell's energy. They were able to harness the power of the well. It might also have details on how to shut it down. One codex entry does give the assumption that the crucible was of great importance to the demons. The presence of such high-ranking demons in the necropolis suggests that the area holds some item of extreme importance or vulnerability to the demons. Current research suggests this may be the lost artifact known as the crucible. The helix stone also led them to finding the sarcophagus that contained the doom slayer. Upon reaching the Lazarus labs, you would locate the helix stone. As you reach out and touch it, more images from a long time ago are shown to you. We see the skeleton of a titan, the icon of sin, and the location of the crucible. It's located in the necropolis. Before you venture off to find it, Samuel Hayden says to the slayer, Retrieving the crucible is critical. Without it, we have no way of shutting down the well and closing the hell portal here on Mars. It's as if he already knew exactly what the crucible can do. Once you reach that area, the Doomslayer battles three hell guards. After emerging victorious, he claims the crucible. But to the Slayer, he does not utilize its full potential. This is the item Olivia Pierce was looking for. The Slayer would later locate three elemental wraiths and release their souls. This was done by using the blades under the handle of the crucible. Once this task was done, he would venture on to battle the spider mastermind. He is then tethered back to Samuel's location, but instead of gratitude, Samuel takes the crucible from the Slayer. He says to him, I am not the villain in this story. I do what I do because there is no choice. Samuel would activate the Argent Energy on the Crucible, which forms a large red blade. He would then tether the Slayer to another location so he does not get in his way. Samuel walks off with the Crucible in his hand, and the story ends. If we look back at Samuel Hayden's office, he had a tablet that showed the Crucible's full form. This might have included instructions on how to activate the Argent Blade of the Crucible. So what happened to the Crucible after this? Well, Samuel would return to Earth and before the Allied Nations Council would show them the Crucible, which could be the salvation mankind was looking for. Hayden agreed to work with them, providing he got access to the UAC facilities on Earth. His main focus was trying to create a method of Argent Synthesis, a synthetic replication that could recreate Argent Energy. The Crucible would act as an Argent Conductor, this would produce the miracle of synthetic, man-made Argent energy, which saved the energy crisis on Earth. Samuel would work with the Allied Nations to form the ARC, which is the Armored Response Coalition. It was designed to be a last line of defense against any threat to Earth, but they were not prepared for what was coming. The forces of Hell came to Earth without warning. Given passage by the UAC Cultist Division, they descended upon the planet with fire and brimstone. The global defense response was immediate as the conflict escalated into total war overnight. The military forces on Earth waged a battle against the invading forces, united against their common enemy in what would prove to be a bloody, relentless fight for survival. Chaos enveloped the planet as human civilization unraveled. With a death toll reaching into the billions within the first month, Earth's Response Coalition deployed advanced mechanized armored exo-infantry and battle mechs, but nothing could defeat the onslaught of the undead legion. Samuel would lead the Ark military to fight against the demon invasion. Armed with the Crucible, he led the army into combat. As they fought with every survival instinct for the sake of mankind, it was not enough. Earth was overrun with demons. Our armies were defeated. Our resources were drained and all that was left were the bodies of soldiers, broken exosuits, and mechs that failed us. So what happened to the Crucible this time? After his defeat, Ark soldiers would retrieve his body along with the Crucible. Both would be stored within an Ark facility. The Doomslayer would find Samuel's broken body and the Crucible. 
Before going back to the Slayer Fortress, he deals with the Marauder who comes through a portal. Marauders were sentinels that sided with the Khan Maker during the Civil War. They were gifted with Maker magic to be resurrected as Marauder Knights in Hell's army. Despite the Slayer being a human and fighting alongside the Sentinels a long time ago, these Marauders did not accept the Slayer in the past, saying, You were never one of us. You are nothing but a false idol, a usurper. When the Slayer returns to his fortress, Samuel transfers himself into the mainframe. The final priest is located and the Slayer sets out to eliminate him. Upon returning, the Khan Maker overloads the systems on the fortress, because some parts of the fortress are of Maker design. She is able to take control of those sections. Assuming there was no more power, the Slayer should not be able to interfere. She plans to resurrect the Icon of Sin under her control, which is covered in Maker armor. But the Khan Maker was unaware that you had the Demonic Crucible. Its Argent energy is used as a power source for the fortress. Meanwhile, Samuel is still in the ship's mainframe guiding you on your mission. Samuel will then send the Slayer to Taras Nabad to retrieve the crucible weapon he used a long time ago when he fought a titan. But the strange thing here is, for some reason, Samuel seems to know a lot of history about the Slayer. He locates his sword still embedded into the chest of the titan. By removing the handle, he leaves the blade intact so the titan will not rise. Back in the vault, he retrieves an energy medallion. It's attached to the handle. He would then forge a new blade for his crucible. The crucible is then used to defeat the Icon of Sin in the end. The blade is pressed into its brain and the creature falls. Now that we've covered the demonic crucible and its whereabouts, there's a secret prophecy in Doom 2016 that has barely gotten any coverage. Located in the Kadingir Sanctum near the Slayer Testament rune, you will find a hell tree, and if you stay close to it, it will repeat four verses from a prophecy. It says this. The first prophecy mentions an infidel or heretic, so that can mean someone who does not believe in religion, and a heretic would be a person with beliefs or the practice of religious heresy or something that goes against what others believe. The codex entry about Erdak does mention religion and how the city's name could translate to heaven or paradise. The seraphim, who is also a maker on Erdak, did betray the con maker. First, by bestowing great powers upon the Slayer from within the Divinity Machine, and then by stealing the essence of the Father. These acts were seen as hearsay. The Seraphim then disappeared after these events. The second prophecy is just saying how Olivia will turn into the Spider Mastermind in Doom 2016, so we can skip that one. But the third prophecy talks about a new enemy, a dark priest consumed by the Crucible and even the Slayer might not be strong enough to stop it. So where is the Crucible now? It's powering the Fortress of Doom, and Samuel Hayden is connected to it. Now is it possible that Samuel Hayden could still get corrupted by the Crucible in this way? The last prophecy says how the Crucible will punish both man and demons. It will sever the balance between them by destroying everything. It will corrupt all realms, so nobody is safe from it. It only seems to mention man and demons, but not makers. Whoever spoke of this did not want anyone to find the crucible, 
so it has a hidden secret other than just being a demonic sword. If there is another Doom game, would the villain be a corrupted Samuel Hayden? The clues are pointing towards Samuel or the Seraphim. The demonic crucible was brought up in a few other sources. The Art of Doom in 2016 has some information on it. It says this, The existence of this ancient artifact is mentioned in inscriptions, in various texts, and depicted in tablets as an object of some great power. The purpose of the artifact is unknown, although it is believed that the object may serve as a ceremonial blade of some kind. Unconfirmed speculation states that the crucible relates to an ancient and prophesied ritual, an event that may coincide with the transference of power to the one who wields the blade. Some maps in Doom 2016 show us a statue that is holding something of interest. The maps are the Offering and Argent Breach. The weapon the statue is holding looks like the Crucible. To further back up this claim, some concept art for three statues are provided by the artist Jason Martin. He mentions that the red statue is holding the Crucible. If we look at these designs, they would resemble the Maker Angels in Doom Eternal. The Codex entry about them has more information. They were angels who held high status of leadership and esteem. These angels were given orator rings, golden halos fused to their armor, as a symbol of their status and rank. They served as overseers or advisors of maker-controlled worlds. But the other two statues do not show any visible halos like the one in the center, so perhaps they were of lesser ranks, or a different design. It does bring up the question, why is an angel holding the demonic crucible, if in fact this person is an angel? These figures are also brought up in more concept art for Doom Eternal, the torture chamber on the left and the hell spire on the right. These figures can be seen on the fortress of Doom and once again, one image is seen holding the crucible. The prophecy of the crucible is not clearly explained to us, but if it is of demonic origin, its true purpose has been kept a secret through the ages. I also noticed these three figures share a color scheme similar to the demon keys for the Unmaker in Doom 64. It could be a coincidence or perhaps they are linked to the Unmaker or the Crucible in some way. I also want to look a bit deeper into the Seraphim character. There's been some theories that Samur Maker could be Samuel Hayden or someone who contacted Samuel about the Con Maker's plans with Hell. Both characters are linked to one voice actor in the credits. Sure, that's a small thing, but there are more similarities. Back in Doom 2016, when you meet up with Samuel, he gives you Argent Energy and he says this, It's a gift. Take it. It will give you strength, help you on your journey. In Doom Eternal, the Seraphim says this, I offer you a gift. Take it. It will give you strength, help you on your journey. You can see both of them deliver the same message. And there's more clues to this theory. When you retrieve Samuel Hayden's body and bring it back to your fortress, his body has components of maker technology. Even an ARC scientist said Samuel's technology was very alien. Samuel's body is made up of technology similar to the Slayer's fortress. This is how the con maker was able to take control and overload the systems. It's possible that one angel amongst them did not agree with the con maker's decision to form a deal with Hell. The Seraphim does not show a visible halo, so he must have been within the lower ranks, or it was removed at some point. It was his sole decision to form a resistance against the cons, and that meant to bless a warrior that could stand up to both demons and angels. Aside from Samuel having a lot of knowledge of the Makers, Sentinels, and Demons, there is one more connection I want to bring up. While in Erdak, Samuel explains how the Khan Maker struck a deal with the Dark Lord. In exchange for more worlds for Hell to devour, the Makers siphoned energy from the Damned. Samuel then says it is an unholy union and cannot stand any longer. While it's not clearly stated, it's a theory that the Seraphim also did not agree with this. He wanted to stop it. This led him to bless the Slayer with incredible speed and strength. So now let's look at something else. Why does a Maker Facility voice call the Slayer Seraphim? Well, I don't think he is exactly THE Seraphim from the past. Perhaps the procedure he underwent inside the Divinity Machine has done more than we know. 
there is more evidence to support this. Dr. Elena Richardson took blood samples from the Slayer back on Mars. Her results indicate there are foreign bodies of unknown origin within him, so maybe those foreign bodies got picked up by the Maker facility and had just read those signatures that belong to the actual Seraphim. During a mission in search of the Soul Spire, Samuel says that no demon has ever set foot on Erdak and no angel ever walked in hell. Erdak's dimension is only accessible to angels, so how are demons there later on? Well, Samuel says that when the con maker awoke the icon of sin on Erdak, this broke the seal between their dimension and others. Now, the demons were invading Erdak. Paradise has now been shattered. The last thing I want to look at is when Vega connects to maker technology to activate a portal back to Earth. He says one specific line that stands out. System acquired, setting a course for the Earth dimension now. I can see now. Am I the father, Dr. Hayden? So what does this mean? If we look at the Codex entries, it says that the father was a logical alien entity that endowed the makers with vast knowledge and technical ability. The father may have been a singular being that split to form the maker race or transferred his incalculable power into the vast structure known as Erdak, which gives birth to con makers. Every 10,000 years, the collective maker consciousness, known as the singularity, births a con maker, a supreme being bound by destiny to lead all of Erdak until the next con is born. It's a natural process for cons to expire over time. But here's the thing. In order to give birth to another con, the father has to be within Erdak. So where is father? Well, according to the Codex, it was stolen by one of their own, Samer Maker, also known as the Seraphim. It seems this person was trying to do anything to stop the Con Maker. This is why the Con Maker needs Argent Energy to stay alive, because they cannot create another Con after her without the Father. And as for Vega, when he says that line, Am I the Father? It could be that Father's essence was placed within Vega a long time ago, because it can be transferred into technology. It's possible the Seraphim hid on Earth waiting for the right time. There's a lot of connections between Samuel and the Seraphim, but one theory is that they are the same person based on these things. Their knowledge, voice, alien technology similar to the Makers, what they say to the Slayer, and motive. What is the difference between the Demonic Crucible and the Sentinel Crucible? Is there a hidden past about the Maker Angels? What's up everyone, Acid Glow here. I was looking into a few topics that I wanted to expand upon, and the more I kept reading, the more questions that popped up. I'm really interested in the prophecy of the Demonic Crucible that I was looking back at Doom 2016, and it got me thinking, how can Samuel Hayden activate the Crucible Blade, but the Doomslayer cannot? So, I have two theories about this, one of them which I mentioned before. The first one is that Samuel already knew more about the Demonic Crucible than anyone else. The tablet he had in his office showed him the full form of the Crucible. Maybe somewhere in that translated information, he learned how to activate it. If we look at the Codex information, it expands on this topic. It says this, The Sentinel people, defined by a legacy of war, deem only those of warrior caste be fit to rule. And in the times of battle, it is expected that the king lead from the battlefield rather than from the safety of the throne. As it is written in sentinel law, a king unfit for battle is likewise unfit to rule. The first step is leading your people into combat in the time of need and not hiding within the castle walls. A man who proves himself in war would be fit to be a king. Another Codex entry talks about what happened after the Doomslayer was blessed by the Seraphim. It says this, He rose unbroken from the ritual, his eyes burning with maker magic. He took the crucible in his hand, and wraith fire leapt forth from the blade, as only it will when held by a true sentinel warrior king. It then continues with this last part, What rose from the holy coffin on that fateful day was not the impure abomination the Covenant warned us of. The hero within would come to be known only as the Great Slayer, the Time Walker, the Warrior Khan, 
whose fire sword would blaze forth a path for the just and cut through the demonic horde with a vengeance that only a god king could summon. So, to sum it up, the slayer was blessed with divine power by the seraphim, and because he was seen as a king in combat, he was worthy to wield the crucible, the only powerful weapon known to slay the titans from hell. But the sentinel crucible was unique, as it says, only the slayer holds knowledge of this venerated sword, for only he has been known to wield it. The second theory on how Samuel activated the demonic crucible blade is this. It's possible that the demonic crucible only activates for a being with evil intent. Since Samuel is showing actions of good and evil, this might be why he was able to activate it. During the mission on Taras Nabad, Samuel recounts what happened to Argent Donor by saying this, The world of Argent Donor has fallen, divided, the demonic energy flows now to the south, and the society you once knew has been replaced by a corrupted world under maker rule. It did not need to end this way. This can be a display of sympathy in some way. When you reach the soul extractor area in Necroval, he says, Your people are made to suffer, processed souls for the con maker's world. I assure you, this could have been avoided with different leadership. Why is he saying your people and not our people? Part of Samuel's backstory was that he was once a human, but now he's not even considering himself as one of them. Yes, I know he has a new body, but the way he used the words just sounds different. You can also see that he said this could have been avoided with different leadership. There's a possibility that he plans to take control, and by using the Slayer, he just might achieve that goal. Not only that, Samuel does imply that he despises the agreement between Hell and Erdak. He says this, This machine was not made without Hell's knowledge. A deal was struck with the Dark Lord. In return for access to more worlds for Hell to devour, the con maker siphoned energy from the damned. It is an unholy union that cannot stand any longer. Because Doom has a few occurrences when they speak about resurrection or reincarnation, this could apply to Sam or Maker being Samuel Hayden in some way. There could be numerous ideas on how this happened. For example, maybe time travel? Maybe the Seraphim fled to Earth and hid there for a long time? Maybe Samuel found the Seraphim during the excavation of the Helix Stone in Doom 2016? He could have been possessed by the Seraphim's essence or spirit. I'm just saying there are so many ideas. So if Samuel was trying to become the Supreme Lord that can rule over all realms, he would need the demonic crucible for this, because the prophecy says it will corrupt all realms. No man or demon is safe. Part of his plan was to eliminate the Khan lineage, retrieve the demonic crucible, and defeat the forces of hell. Now this brings up another question. I was thinking about the statues throughout the multiplayer maps in Doom 2016, which also appeared in Doom Eternal. I was looking at their design and another idea came up. They remind me of the elemental wraiths. Is it a coincidence that there's three statues, just like there were three wraiths? When the power of the wraiths was poisoned by the Hell Priest long ago, that was the last time we saw them until Doom 2016. Is it possible that they were reincarnated as these beings we see now? Let's say for this theory this is true, and these beings are really demons who were wraiths in the past. Is it possible that when Hell and the Makers made their deal, Hell wanted a guarantee that the Con Maker would fulfill her side of the bargain? Maybe these three characters were appointed positions in Erdak and just renamed as Maker Angels, but they are really something else. If you look at their design, they don't look like Maker Drones or the Con Maker. They are so different. So if this is true, what's the reason? It says in the Codex, they oversee worlds controlled by the Khan Maker, maybe deciding which world or realm is going to be consumed by Hell next. But if they oversaw worlds controlled by the Khan Maker, could they have any leverage in the Khan Maker's decisions? Well, two of these statues have weapons or artifacts we don't know of, but one of them has the Demonic Crucible. This weapon could have been feared by the Khan Maker to make sure she never broke the agreement she had with Hell. She even says upon her defeat, Your transgressions here 
will jeopardize all of creation. Whoever wields the demonic crucible will certainly have the power to destroy anything. I also want to expand on the theory of that mysterious voice. I did mention before, it could have been Vega the Father or even the Dark Lord. But another idea is that it could have been the collective mind of all the con makers from the past. The way it screamed in the end might have just been their disappointment in realizing the con maker lineage is done. It does make sense, but until we get clear information, the mysterious voice could be anyone's guess. The amount of story they put into Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal is amazing. I like how they were able to insert different species, alternate timelines, and how the original games are connected. In this era of gaming, a robust story can also enhance the gaming experience. It gives you that sense of connecting with certain characters and wanting to know what happens next. Despite the original Doom game having a really big plot, which was taken from the Doom Bible, most of those story elements were scrapped and replaced with just an ending text. As I look at Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, I can say I enjoyed those games a little bit more because of that awesome story they created. The whole thing about Erdak being created by some logical alien entity called the Father, the con maker forming a deal with Hell, then throw in the demonic crucible, Samuel Hayden who does acts of good and evil, then combine that with a deep story of the Sentinel people. The whole package as a story is what I find really intriguing. I love history, documentaries of the past, forgotten civilizations and cultures that were kept in secret. So the story of Doom Eternal is exactly what I like about the campaign. What's up everyone, welcome back to some more Doom Eternal lore. So in the last video, I covered a few characters and topics that barely got mentioned since the announcement of Doom Eternal. Now we're going to look at some small lore pieces about some other characters. While this information is only a small portion, we will get a deeper look into each character through the codex entries when the game is released. I'm also going to include my thoughts on some of these characters. I want to start off with the Pain Elemental, a returning enemy from previous Doom games. It says here, an abhorrent creation of the Umbral Plains. The Pain Elemental is descended from the primal, abominable depths of the demon world. Knowing only its own torment, the Pain Elemental is cursed to forge lost souls within the fiery pit of its gut, a process that is excruciating and without end for the duration of the creature's miserable life. The Pain Elemental's only reprieve from its own agonizing and torturous existence is the projection of suffering into the world. For this reason, the Pain Elemental reaps great satisfaction from killing indiscriminately, destroying its environment and inflicting misery on the innocent. From that description, it seems to indicate that the creature is fully aware of the pain it endures during its existence. Not only that, but it seems to have a motive or desire to cause pain and suffering onto other beings. So it's not a mindless creature after all. Its actions seem to be an act of revenge because of how it suffers. Next up is one of the newer creatures in Doom Eternal. Meet the Carcass. It's the product of inhuman biomechanical engineering. The Carcass was created in the remote labs of the cultist Enclave, neither truly living nor dead. It exists in a state of partial reanimation. Its cybernetic armature simulating a living impulse within a decaying organic host. Devised as a means of extending a soldier's usefulness in combat after death, the unliving host can only be destroyed by severing the body from its cybernetic implants. Judging by its name, I get the idea that it's supposed to be a pile of rotting flesh slapped onto some machinery. I'm just saying, the name really fits the art design. Since it was created by the cultists, it seems like they were trying to grab every scrap of body they could find, and they come up with this. It's pretty gross, but still a cool design. And now, let's look at the Tyrant, which was previously known as the Cyber Demon back in the other Doom games. From the gameplay footage I've seen online, it seems they wanted a lot of higher tier enemies in Doom Eternal. Something else they can throw at the Doom Slayer from time to time, and not just as a single boss battle. So it seems we're going to see this enemy pretty often in the game. So the information we have about the Tyrant is that they are demon lords of the Black Soul Pits of Bobble. 
the tyrants have long served as wardens and slavers of the infernal pits. Weaponized and cybernetically altered by the USC, the tyrants are tasked with overseeing the collection and extraction of sin-branded human souls from the mortal world. They impose rule as ordained by the unholy sigil of the elder demon gods, sadistic masters of lesser demons. The tyrants are feared for their cruelty and malice. Next up is a small note about the hell priests. It talks about the fall of Exultia, which is also mentioned in the Codex entries. During a time when the Doomslayer had allied with the Sentinels, they agreed to take a group of their finest warriors and wage an attack against the Khan Maker. The priests would go with them to a certain point. Then, through their lies, they said they would help the Sentinels in their cause. Persuaded by the priests, the Sentinels believed their words. Destroy the foundry and victory is assured. But we were all fools to believe their lies. We sent the Doomslayer and the Night Sentinels on this task through a gate. When the last of our group was through, the priests closed the gate, trapping them, leaving them stranded and lost in the eternal void. With the fall of Exultia, the Sentinel Theocracy began to change. It had long served as the mortal foundation for the Sentinel Society, but its demise caused a chain reaction throughout the world. The priesthood, falling under the insidious and gradual persuasion of Hell's influence, in time abandoned the holy text and disavowed its founding doctrine. An era of corruption followed, destroying the church from within. One thing I want to mention is when King Novik says to the Slayer, you cannot kill the priests, you know our laws. Despite their transgressions against the covenant, they are still of sentinel blood. So this means the Slayer cannot eliminate a priest by normal means. We later see the Doom Slayer acquire a medallion, which possibly gives him the power to eliminate the Hell Priest once and for all. Ever since Doom Eternal was announced, we have seen new monsters throughout various media outlets. While some old monsters are returning with small adjustments to their body, other creatures are shown with an entirely new concept and design. The Gargoyle is a new enemy in Doom Eternal. It says that this demon is a cousin of the Imp. It's agile, a relentless pack hunter, native to the Sentinel world, and plagued the Sentinel guards for centuries. The Gargoyle could appear without warning and claim hapless townspeople before disappearing into the wasteland. Only the most skilled marksmen of the Night Sentinel could intercept this aerial threat, a peril which necessitates an ever-vigilant watch over the city's perimeter. If we look back at the Doom Bible, which was all the ideas planned for the original Doom game, it shows that one enemy they had in mind was a flying imp. I'm not saying a flying imp idea was taken from the Doom Bible, I'm just showing that this variation was mentioned before Doom Eternal. Next up is The Revenant. With the destruction of the UAC facility on Mars, the Revenant species should not have returned. But here's the answer. The newly emerged cultist enclave on Earth, which was made up of former UAC divisions who are now under Hell's direct control, have begun work on a second wave of production of the Revenant program. While much of the platform's existing weapon payload is preserved as originally designed, the cyber neural programming has undergone modifications. Patterned signals, which simulate a state of frenzied, unrestrained bloodlust, are wired to the host's frontal cortex. While these signals are active, the host is incapable of thinking or feeling anything. It has a single compulsion, to inflict death and violence on the living. While its combat tactics have remained the same, it now has a special ability. The targeted rocket barrage shoots out a volley of rockets, Multiple rockets are released at an increased speed. Another new demon in Doom Eternal that I want to look at is the Doom Hunter. It's mostly made up of mechanical parts with very little organic material. The design is very unique in that it hovers above the ground for movement. It has weapons for close and long range combat. According to the lore, they were an ancient race of beast-like hunters. The Sentinels knew about the Doom Hunter as a lethal stalker during the Metal Age. Extracted from the frozen depths of the polar tundra, 
the Doom Hunter was uncovered during cultist excavation in the remote Arctic. Though preserved below for millions of years, the unearthed remains of this creature were deemed suitable for reconstruction, becoming the subject of cultist necroregenerative bio-experimentation. Within the remote cultist citadel, a high-tech ritual altar which towers over the Golgothon ruins, the Doom Hunter was ceremoniously and systematically resurrected and rebuilt. While the majority of its components are now cybernetic, it retains a high degree of mental faculty, a sentient, brutal hunting instinct, augmented with the armaments of a tank division. The official trailer revealing the Doom Hunter has someone saying they were once called the Great Argodon Hunters, long thought to be extinct, created to hunt only the Slayer and if not, the Sentinels during the Unholy Crusade. Enjoy what is undoubtedly my finest work. Since the cultist group is led by the Hell Priests, it's most likely that one of them was responsible for bringing back the Doom Hunter. This leads us to look at how the cultists are connected to the UAC. After the events on Mars in 2016, the UAC splintered into competing factions. In their search to tap into Hell's dimension, the secret research divisions of the UAC would become drawn to its power. This opened a pathway to evil. They were now corrupted by Hell's influence. They united and broke away from the UAC. Later on, they would establish their own presence on Earth. Despite their previous traditions, they would soon mutate into a cult of ritual sacrifice and blood offerings to ancient demonic gods. Consumed by evil, the cult's followers had become living shells, human vessels for Hell's bidding, ultimately answering directly to the commands of the elusive Hell Priest, Dig Ranak. The last demon we will look at is the Archvile, and finally, we have some actual new lore about this demon. It says this, Forged from the Hellfire, the Archvile is feared among lesser demons for its innate ability to channel and manipulate the unholy powers of Hell magic. Descended from the eldest race of demons, the Archvile has long held a place within the ruling caste of highborn lords, possessing superior intellect among the demon ranks. The Archvile's psychomancy powers make it a natural born ruler of the savage and primitive beasts of hell, capable of bending weak-minded underlings to serve its will. Doom Eternal, along with Doom 2016, has quite a bit of lore, from weapons, demons, environments, and codex entries. While I have covered a lot of topics within the Doom universe, something that I wanted to look at were the Korax tablets. There's been a few throughout both games, and they tie into the full story in some way, but others tend to leave us with even more mysteries. So let's go over the various Korax tablets and discuss the information they have. Starting off in Doom 2016, the Korax tablets are linked to a few demons. The first one we can look at is the Lost Soul. It says here, These demons are found wandering aimlessly within the temples of Hell, as they search for a host to inhabit. When a potential victim is found, they will converge on the target and explode with a blast of hell energy. Lesser-willed beings weakened by the explosion will then be possessed by the demon and the host soul becomes lost in turn. Tablets retrieved from the Korax suggest the lost souls are considered the lowest of the demons, even lower than imps, since the wandering nomads, doomed to forever roam the halls of hell, thrive on the weakest entities. Lost souls are despised by the other demons. Despite their lowly status, they should not be underestimated. This seems to imply that the demons of hell would have an understanding of their own hierarchy system, which is why the other demons dislike the lost souls. Next up is the Cyber Demon. The Korax tablets discovered during the UAC automated survey of 2143 mention an ancient battle in the Titan's realm during the Third Age. An expedition to the plains recovered several relics, including the petrified remains of a massive Shadow Lord, believed to be an ancient Bulgar demon. Researchers in the Lazarus Labs began work on piecing the creature back together. At first, the project mandate was to construct an educational and inspirational exhibit. 
However, the focus quickly shifted when an attempt to melt the petrified tissue uncovered that exposure to small doses of plasmatic argent energy would reanimate the relic, the potential of creating living, growing tissue from the relic, and the lure of an ultimate battle demon was too enticing to pass up. The project team quickly shifted direction and began work on melding the ancient remains with high-tech weaponry. So, did you ever wonder what the original Cyberdemon looked like? It's actually linked to Doom 2016 and another game. The other game is called Wolfenstein RPG, and it did include a final boss called the Harbinger of Doom. The player controls the character BJ Blazkowicz, who would use the holy weapon, the Spear of Destiny, to destroy its left arm and right leg. The ending has the demon saying, No, I will find your blood, your descendants will pay meaning that he would return someday as the cyber demon in future Doom games. And one descendant of Blazkowicz is the Doom Guy, or the Doom Slayer. This picks up in Doom 2016, when the UAC would find the demon's body, they attach cybernetic parts to it, and reanimate its flesh with argent energy. Wolfenstein RPG would serve as a prequel to the Doom games. The final note about this being is in the Art of Doom book from 2016. It says this, these demons are of the highest rank among the denizens of hell. They offer service to no one, even the named demons. At first, it was believed that this was in fact a unique demon, as it is held in reverence among the lower order. But a tablet found in the Temple of Korax revealed that it is a unique genus of demon, only found deep within the bowels of hell. Within the Titan's realm, there are various regions that remained unexplored by the UAC. One such area is the Great Steppe. The Korax tablets describe this area in detail. Through the Titan's realm and down, down to the Great Steppe, where the trophies of victory are kept through the ages, their false idols banished to a wasteland, their towers fallen, their foundations ground to dust, their hollowed halls kept empty as cruel reminders that civilizations shall fall before the ascension of the Great Ones. This description seems to be about the victories Hell has won, and the trophies of their victims are left in the Great Steppe. Countless civilizations have been destroyed and consumed by Hell. Not one has survived the ascension of Hell and its leaders. While the UAC was excavating the ruins within Mars, they were able to decode some tablets and scriptures the data they collected was limited, but the Korax tablets suggest that Argent Denor is now a corrupted, lost ruin, a world that was conquered and then absorbed into the Hell Dimension. The battle that took place here was of great significance, as the spread of Hell's dominion accelerated upon absorption of the region. The Hell energy that emanates from this region passes through a dimensional tear and appears on Mars at the Argent Fracture. The Korax Tablets describes it in this manner, All falls before the command of hell, for our power is absolute, our march to victory inevitable. Before our armies, even the elemental wraiths of Argent Anur were subjugated. In that great victory, the Night Sentinels, protectors of the wraiths, were betrayed by one of their own, and the wretches wept as we devoured their world and took the well for our own devices. None stand against us, for treachery resides in all things, and we shall set it free. This part is just describing about the process of when the demons would conquer any adversary, and through betrayal of their own, they conquered the land, corrupted it, and then absorbed it. I did cover the crucible and its hidden prophecy in two videos before, but Olivia Pierce did leave a final note before she became the spider mastermind. Here's what it says. Now let us tell you about the real heaven. The real kingdom of the gods is a place that you will never reach, and you should never wish to. No human will ever visit the sacred ground of Argent Dunur, unless they are made a god by the Dark Lords. Humanity's only purpose and reward is to serve the ascension of the Imperatrix and protect the Crucible. You will be destroyed by the demons, while I will be made a god. My immortality is assured, while you will writhe in perpetual agony at the bottom of the darkest hole in hell. You will be forgotten. 
Your life, your loved ones, your achievements and failures are nothing. A blank space on the canvas of time. Thank you for your service. May you rot in hell. So, we know Olivia was turned into the Aranya Imperatrix. The word Aranya translates to spider. Imperatrix is just the female version of Imperator, which means supreme commander or emperor, something along those lines. So, its English version would fit the name of Spider Mastermind. But the key thing about her last note is she said, Humanity is meant to protect the crucible. So, she must have known how powerful it was at some point, considering she was looking for it also. But it brings up the question, if she was guaranteed immortality from the Dark Lord, why would she be searching for the crucible in the first place? Was it for herself? If the Dark Lord wanted her to retrieve it, he would have told her exactly where it was, unless he didn't know where it was. Perhaps the crucible belonged to someone so powerful and it was sealed away to never be found, not even by the Dark Lord or other beings in Hell. Now on to Doom Eternal. When playing through this stage, Taras Nabad, Samuel Hayden gives you information about its history. According to the Korax tablet, the city would have been lost had it not been for the arrival of the Slayer. This coincides with the rest of the story about this city. Taras Nabad was the first recorded demon attack in Argent to Nur. The Slayer would arrive here in search of his crucible, a weapon he used long ago to defeat the titan that attacked the Sentinel City. It was his first battle against the demons in this world, where the legend of the Slayer began. As the Black Star ascended to its zenith, King Novik sat restless on his throne. As a howling darkness began to assemble, just beyond the mountain rise to the east, the blight came upon us in droves, flooding forth from the Hellgate with merciless fury. They brought with them a monstrous titan, the Dreadnought, a beast to rival the stature and menace of even the mightiest ancestral. The demon army was pushing forward as the people of Argenta started to flee north. Even though they were caught off guard, the sentinels scrambled late in defiance of the titan and his horde. With his coming, the holy city of Tarasnabad prepared for judgment, and amongst them stood the outlander. Rip and tear, he roared. Ferocious in battle he was. But as the swarm had fallen, the titan appeared invincible. The outlander remained at the foot of the great wall in the northern bend of the castle. Seeing his unending vigor, Samer Maker, chancellor to the mother god, hurried the outlander away under veil of secrecy, and for reason unknown submitted him to a right untold. The outlander was granted divine power and speed. In the laws of the makers, this was hearsay, for Samer did not receive consent for his actions. So that Korax tablet only tells us the short version of the Slayer, the Titan, and how his newfound powers saved the city. There are two more Korax tablet translations in the Codex entries of Doom Eternal. It's under the subject, Fuel the Eternal Flame, but it's something I've already covered before. It just talks about how the conmaker struck a deal with the Dark Lord. Hell would be given new worlds to consume, and soul spires would be erected to absorb the souls of the tortured people that remained. Once the souls were extracted, their bodies would mold into a demon. The souls would then be refined with wraith energy and subjected to the infernal fires of hell itself. This would create argent energy. The conmaker would use this to avoid the transfiguration process. The con makers are designed to expire after a certain amount of time. By using Argent Energy, she would extend her normal lifespan, but at the cost of innocent souls. When we look at the full story, from when the Doomslayer spent time in Argent de Noor and then being awakened from his sarcophagus, there is one specific Korax tablet entry that has a very interesting note. When you start up a fresh campaign in Doom 2016, the loading screen has this at the bottom. So you walk eternally through the shadow realms, standing against evil where all others falter. May your thirst for retribution never quench. May the blood on your sword never dry. And may we never need you again. This part seems to give the indication that someone knew about his battles across different realms. And when all the others have failed, only he would remain standing. 
It also says they hope the Slayer's thirst for revenge is never ending, that he would continue to slay demons with his sword. But the last part sounds like someone never wants to call upon the Slayer again. Who could this be? Was it someone linked to the Sentinel people? Or is it a reference to how Samuel Hayden awakened the Slayer? There's a bit of lore about hell itself in the art of Doom Eternal. It says this, Bound by the forces of chaos, hell is unlimited by boundaries of space, time, or dimension. Hell is itself a living thing, an entity possessing certain undeniable sentience, and inverse image of the living world. Hell thrives on the destruction of life, and the greater the pain and suffering it inflicts into our world, the more powerful it becomes. For all of eternity, hell has been ruled by an ancient order of evil, six sovereign chapters of the six eldest demon gods, descendants of the six unholy bloodlines, born from the primordial black heart. For an eternity, the nameless one has brought treachery, torment, and war to other worlds. Driven by an insatiable hunger to secure its dominion over the souls of the living, many worlds have fallen to hell, each now bound to ruin, connected by pathways of darkness transcending space and time. For the longest time, we thought hell was just a place of torment, hate, and corruption. But in the Doom universe, hell is revealed to be a living entity in some way. It feeds off the pain and suffering of other beings. The last thing that I want to look at is the lore about the specter in Doom Eternal. It brings up a very interesting topic within hell. This is what it says. Born from an ancient screed of forbidden psychomancy, it was the Ptolemaic inscriptions of the occultic six-sealed eyes that the specter was made manifest, divined in desecrated ruins, untouched by light for an eternity, warlocks of an abandoned sovereign race, unearth the verboten scripture, seeking rebellion by means of black magic against the rule of the infernal archdemons. By way of sorcery were numerous abominations and ungodly forms brought forth into the hellscape, among them the specter, ethereal amalgam of the pinky. For their role in these miscreations, the archdemons would enact as retribution against its insurgents, an unspeakable punishment, a decree of suffering that would be without end. Looking at this information, it seems to tell us that not all groups of demons are obedient and loyal. It gives the impression that there is an internal war somewhere. Some group in hell is going against the archdemons, so they created the specter as an act of rebellion. But how would the archdemons respond for them creating this unwanted demon? Well, they would punish any insurgents who oppose them. So that covers a lot of topics within the lore of Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. I'm going to make more compilation videos like this in the future because it just makes it easier for my viewers to find specific topics instead of going through a playlist that has a lot of lore videos over different franchises. But if you enjoyed this video, leave a like rating on it. And to see more content like this, subscribe to my channel. This is Carlos or Acid Glow. And I'll see you in the next video.